Okay, got it. Sure, go ahead. Okay, yeah. Um, well, <clears throat> I think uh, that I'm kind of in a different situation from a lot of you and that uh, uh, a lot of you are probably doing your own research and digging into records and books and whatever. And um, I actually have a you know wealth of information uh, uh, that has been put together by family members uh, here and, and then also in Norway. And so my job is uh, is to trying to sort through it and trying to make connections and uh, and then also try to produce uh, maybe a you know, kind of a consolidated family tree on um, ancestry.com. Um, and also, I kind of wanted to be able to talk to you all and uh, and connect with you all uh, to see if there's any connections between, you know, uh, what I have and, and uh, what you have, perhaps. Um, my family, uh, <clears throat> actually, it's my father's side of my family, uh, comes from a town called Vestnes. And I don't know how many are familiar with that uh, town, but uh, Vestnes is right across the Romstal Fjord uh, from Molde. And uh, so if you take the... Uh, if you take the ferry from Mulder down uh, to the south, then you're going to go into Vestnes. And um, Vestnes is on a, <clears throat> on a kind of an arm, southern arm of the, the Romsdal Fjord. It goes to, <clears throat> uh, you know, make some 20 or 30 miles probably. Um, <clears throat> and uh, that, that fjord is called the Trest Fjord. So my relatives basically, uh, in the area that I'm talking about then is, uh, is Vestnes and Trest Fjord. And, and the farms and, and the villages and, and whatever in that uh, general area. And, and what I would describe it as is a kind of a fairy tale setting. Um, now, I actually have two people I'm going to be talking about or two stories to tell. And the first one is, uh, is about a, a fellow by the name of uh, Henrik uh, Johnson Remen. That's R E M M E M. Uh, and that uh, he uh, actually was born. Uh, with a, a different name, Henrik Johnson uh, Skoganis. And of course, uh, as we've learned in, in a lot of discussions uh, on ancestry, the, you, know, you end up taking up the name, the farm that you happen to live on at a particular time. And he didn't actually get onto this farm until he was, uh, I think, 40 years old. So um, it's a story of, uh, well, the, he, he's a third great grandfather of mine. Uh, the dates are 1771 to 1841. And uh, he is a person of considerable interest to, uh, well, our family and, and actually quite a few people. Um, and to the extent that uh, he was a, um, a member of parliament uh, in, in 1824 for three years. And he went on to be kind of a civic leader there in the Vestness area. Um, and it turns out that um, he was said so much of a, uh, of a uh, first of interest that, uh, uh, they have actually, the distant relatives actually published a little booklet, um, uh, uh, booklet on him. Uh, and it's quite a booklet. Let's see. I don't know. Let's see. Well, anyway, th th it's a booklet. Um, uh, and the, the booklet actually was written, was written by a fellow by the name of Odd Soros. Now, if you look at my name, my name is Soros. And that's not Norwegian uh, spelling, obviously. So my name is actually Suros, and it's a Sur meaning south, and uh, and uh, Os meaning uh, hill. So uh, that's um, Suros, uh, you know, from the Vestnes area. Um, so Odd Soros had done this research, and uh, he he had researched everything imaginable that uh, could be learned about this uh, fellow, and he calls it uh, a local leader in the age in which he lived, uh, and the. Um, uh, the, the article was originally published in the Norwegian in, in the uh, Romstad Historic Society yearbook in 2002. So it's been published and it was uh, then translated in English uh, by another woman. Uh, her name was uh, uh, Karen Overos. And, uh, and the book probably was put together because there's a huge uh, contingent of, of relatives out in uh, British Columbia on a different uh, branch of the family there. Um, I think it would be of interest to you uh, because there's uh, uh, obviously some genealogical information here, um, but with a big question. Um, and then it has a wealth of historic uh, uh, perspective. Uh, and I think that may be of even more interest because it talks about uh, the time in which he lived and, uh, and, and has contributed. And so what I'm going to do is actually read 
uh, some expert, well, some paragraphs out of the book. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is just put this back up again. Uh, you'll see that there's a there's a picture there on the front, um, and it's a painting, um, and it's uh, it's called From Festmas, and the uh, the painter is one uh, Henrik Ibsen, uh, who uh, the name uh, rings a bell, I think, um, and it turns out that. Uh, in 1862, he got a travel grant from the University of Christiana to collect folk tales and legends in Western Norway. And he went through Vesnes, and I guess he wrote up three pages worth of information from Vesnes, and, and then uh, stayed quite a bit in Molde, where they had friends. But uh, the, the caption basically said that uh, some of the things he found out from this uh, fairy tale setting, uh, you know, and, you know, were inspiration for things that, uh, that, um, Ended up in Pier Gint. So let me uh, uh, talk about uh, Henrik Grimm, and I'm going to read uh, some uh, some paragraphs here from the uh, from the book. And the reason I'm doing this, well, two reasons: the the, the fellow has a way of telling stories that uh, is interesting, and then he also puts it in in perspective. So he says uh, Henrik Grimm was born in Skogneset in the Vestnes in the year that Johan Nordahl Brunn sat in Copenhagen writing Norwegians Norways. First national anthem by Norge Schempers Bödeland. Now, that, that, uh, when uh, Henrik took his seat in the Norwegian parliament more than 50 years ago, later, Norway had just adopted its net second national anthem, Söner of Norge, and was celebrating the 10th anniversary for the Norwegian's constitution, Norway's constitution. Well, that first national anthem, uh, well, that was, that was written in 1771. Uh, which was, uh, you know, some time before, uh, you know, the, the Norway became independent. And so it's probably talking in terms of uh, uh, the, the, the growing national spirit of uh, Norway, but uh, it was also the fact that this fellow was writing it in Copenhagen. Um, so then uh, we'll go to the next paragraph. Um, at the time, Henrik was uh, taking his first steps at home in Skogneset. Another boy was toddling along in his family's home in Majasio in Corsica. And when Henrik was uh, shepherding the cows and eating blueberries like every child in Tresfjord in the summer, the Corsican boy was playing in his family's olive grove. He was about to influence, he, meaning the fellow in an olive grove, was about to influence both Norwegian and European history, and thereby Henrik's life. His name, his family name was uh, Bonaparte. And his family first name was Napoleon. Now that um, um, that's an interesting comparison, but there's a, uh, of course uh, we have to remember that the uh, Napoleonic Wars were a uh, important factor in the Norwegian history. Um, up to that time, they were uh, you know, we were part of a remote province of Denmark, and then uh, Denmark happened to lose the war, <laughs> was on the losing side, and uh, and we got connected then with Sweden. So this is a kind of an interesting perspective. Okay, Henrik was intended for a somewhat more humble place in history in the world than was Napoleon. He was born in a country with less than 750,000 inhabitants that was part of the Danish empire. When he died, the number of Norwegians had increased by 500,000. I didn't realize there were that few Norwegians at the time, uh, but uh, apparently this was true. Um, the average duration of life also increased a lot during that time, and people were doing better than before, even though they still lived with huge economic and social differences. Uh, the young Norwegian state was growing inside the union with Sweden. Local self-government was also developing quickly. Henrik made a contribution to the foundation for this through his work in parliament and local politics. Now, Henrik himself came from more, uh, very poor circumstances. As late as age 40, he was enrolled as a cotter in the church book. Now it says here that a cotter was a farm laborer or tenant that occupying a cottage and usually also some land in return for labor. Um, so he came from poor circumstances and at 40, he was a courtier. Then at 41, he was not only a farmer, <laughs> he was the owner of several excellent farms. At 50, he was elected to the Norwegian parliament the parliamentary session he attended in 1824 was, according to Sverre Steen, a history professor, made making so brave decisions that it has been seen 
held by posterity in a historic light. Long after he turned 60, he crowned his achievement by becoming the first chairman of an executive committee of the local council on vestments. And all this time he collected uh, duties and positions. He could also dress himself up with the King's Medal of Heroism. All of this tells about a man that great, earned great respect during his period of life. But uh, he was possibly also envied and talked about uh, behind his back. <clears throat> <clears throat> a lot of uh, Henrik's life is hidden to us and questions queue up. The most important one is how could a cotter who was the son of a poor farmer become so rich overnight that he could get hold of several farms together with a, worth, together with a fortune? Is the answer hidden in what local people were talking about during this time and what has been publicly accepted in subsequent generations that Henrik could not have been the son of uh, John at Scriganus, but was um, rather the son of the bailiff in Romstall, uh, Jacob Andreas Egg of Germundus. Now, I don't know how familiar we are with the term of bailiff, but uh, you know, from what I'm reading here, the bailiff was the, basically the representative of the king of the Denmark. And uh, so he would have the connections uh, to the, you know, the well, he would have been appointed by the king, connections, royal family, and also to, uh, um, uh, to the aristocracy and so forth. So uh, the question then is, uh, who's the father, basically? But anyway, let me continue here. Okay, so he was, uh, his father of record was John Hansen Skorgenis, uh, was born in uh, 1746, and he grew up in a small farm at Skorgeniset on the western shores of, uh, of Tresfjord. Um, and then uh, when John took over the farm, his only ambitions were probably to find a wife, to share table and bed and hard work, to have a few children for security in their old age. They did it, needed insurance like this since there was not much of a living at Skurgnesset. John's father even had to get money uh, from the poor relief fund in his declining days. Well, he needed a wife. <clears throat> so a wife showed up. <laughs> That's actually a sentence in the book. At uh, Midsummer's Eve, uh, 1771, John walked to the altar in the old church in Vestness with uh, Geary, Knut's daughter, Mulder. Uh, the, the, the name Mulder tells us that her family must have come from the city across the fjord and that they had lived somewhere at the farm Mulder, nowadays called Muldegore. Um, it is said that uh, Geary worked as a servant for the bailiff of Romstone. Remember him again. Uh, Jacob Andreas Egg. And that might well be correct, since in the tax list from 1762, there is listed a Gary Knut's daughter among the servants at uh, Germundus. <clears throat> now, uh, Giri, uh, now it's, it's spelled Giri, but and, and she was also uh, uh, Gertrude, I think, but, but so, um, it turns out was about three months pregnant when she got married to John in the summer day on the uh, on the on the summer day three days pregnant or three months pregnant and on the third day of Christmas a boy was born in their little farmhouse um, they then six months later they then headed for the church again on Sunday January 12 1772 this Gorgonus boy was wearing a very pretty baptism dress and a hat with a lot of embroidery um, there were two children to be baptized this Sunday. The well-known vicar for the Deo uh, parish, Eric Röhring, uh, poured water over the heads one by one. First little Ola Olsen Gjellevik. And, uh, and then, as the vicar writes in the church book, with his clear handwriting, uh, John Henson Skogena's son, called Hendrik. But Röhring re reveals a bit more in the same church book. He always counted the months, now this is the minister, he counted the months between marriage and birth. And Hendrik's parents got the same comment as many uh, others, slept together too early. This is stated in clear hand and underlined. <laughs> as documentation, he wrote down the date of John and uh, Geary's birth.
Okay, so uh, we cannot be sure that all Henrik's godmothers or godfathers and godmothers who are enrolled in the church book were present at the font. But if they were, the congregation must have been mazed. Such a collection of godfathers and godmothers was barely ever seen when a boy from a poor family was baptized. Naturally, the boy's father as uh, father's brothers were present, uh, Kirsten and Søren. But there is also a third godfather present, a person of rank. He is written in the church book as uh, Monsieur uh, Andres Nordloff. Well, I, I, who was he? But uh, probably the three godmothers were the persons which most people noticed with surprise on this occasion. Three sisters in their 20s and 30s, and most people knew them well, the maidens, Anna and Katrina, Gertrude Dorthea and Martina, Christina Egg all daughters of the bailiff, Jacob Andreas. Uh, the first two were often called the Remen girls. Did they act as godmothers to honor a popular servant? Or was there another reason why this bailiff's family took the godmother mother responsibility? So uh, here at baptism, then there's a, uh, um, there's a connection to this, uh, the, the bailiff of, uh, of, uh, of Moore, John Andreas. Well, so up until 40, he was, uh, he was still a poor cotter. And then uh, he came into, uh, in, in, into these three farms. Um, and one of the farms was Remem. Now, Remem is a settlement uh, just south of Vesnes on uh, Tracefield. And there are actually two, uh, two small, well, there is a farm settlement, and there are two farms at Remem. And uh, the third farm, it turns out, uh, was a farm called Suros, which, of course, is, is our family farm. So who did he buy these farms from? Well, it's these three sisters, uh, of, uh, daughters of the um, daughters of the um, of the bailiff. And um, uh, well, there's there's they have a quotation here from the uh, the, the the contract, and it was uh, it was bought for six hundred or six thousand rix dollars. And the contract is signed by all three of the Egg sisters. Um, so once a question pops up, how could Henrik manage to buy so much? Buying a farm like Bremen was more, uh, more than most people could dream of buying. Three at a time was something only very wealthy people. What was the real cost? Well, the, the gist of it is, uh, you know, uh, there's no question he couldn't have afforded to buy it. So he must have gotten a special deal from these uh, three sisters. Now, if in fact, of course, um, well, it says in any case during the spring of 1812, Henrik suddenly was the owner of three grand farms. Um, at uh, Soros, at so Soros, he had uh, leaseholders. Um, at Bremen, he lived uh, together with both his family and the Egg sisters. Uh, so, and then they, the contract basically says that the Egg sisters could live there uh, for the duration. Now, they were all made well, they were unmarried, and uh, they're sisters, of course. And uh, if, uh, of course, uh, uh, Hendrik was uh, also a, a son of the bailiff, these would have been, uh, well, they would have been uh, half-sisters. Uh, so now we can see there's quite, a, quite an argument to be made that, uh, that the, um, the bailiff was the, uh, was the actual father. And... Uh, the author of this book basically posed the question, and then at the very end, he said, that, "You know, here's all some you know, list of different arguments, and and one of the things was that um, that the bailiff had actually told uh, uh, Hendrik Bremen uh, uh, that uh, he was his father, and so generations probably of the Soros family have basically accepted that that's what's happening. Um, so uh, this gets us to kind of two two kind of issues here. Um, uh, uh, one is the issue of, of paternity. And uh, so uh, if, if, uh, if uh, Jacob Andreas Egg, in fact, was the father of uh, uh, Hendrik Remen, then uh, we can kind of claim uh, Jacob Andreas Egg as uh, our fourth great, uh, great grandfather and follow his ancestors. And it turns out now he's come from, he was a representative of the king and, and uh, his family came from Denmark and they, uh, they have quite a, uh, quite a history. So I have a, 
uh, another work uh, that has been done by uh, my cousin, one of my cousins. Uh, his name has happened to be Rodney Stone. Um, and he'd done a very th thorough job of researching family history on, uh, on both sides of uh, you know, the, my family and then also on his father's family. And it turns out that, um, uh, uh, well, yeah, that, I guess just say that you've done a whole lot of research. Okay, and so, you know, I said that I have a lot of material and I have two volumes that look like this uh, of material on our family history. And so he's uh, gone through then and, uh, to, to follow the ancestry of uh, Jacob Andreas Egg. Uh, and then what he has found out is that this, uh, uh, this history goes way, way back in Denmark uh, and, uh, and Germany and, uh, and Sweden and, and of course Norway. And the earliest, earliest ancestor in this line was you know, one Accretius de Munt, who was born in, in uh, 1072 in, in, in Germany. Um, but it, by claiming this, you know, this fellow is uh, this, you know, this bailiff is our ancestor, then we get uh, some very interesting people. Um, uh, well, for example, here's a, a fellow by the name of Soren Stog. He was mayor of Reba in Denmark. Uh, a fellow by the name of Adam Adam Abelson van Munte, born in 1495, and he was a merchant in Lübeck. Um, um, uh, here's a Hans Ludwigson van Munte, born uh, 1560 in Germany, and he was a parish priest in uh, Tickjob, uh, Denmark, but he was the tutor uh, with his brothers to the sons of King Frederick II. Um, and then there was... Uh, uh, Ludwig Hansen von Munte, born in uh, 1593 in Denmark, died in 1649 in Norway. He was a par parish priest, a royal court minister for King Christian IV, and he was also a bishop of Bergen uh, in Norway. So, okay, here, so here, we, if, uh, if we accept uh, what everybody else is trying to accept, now we've got some very distinguished history going back possibly to 1072. Okay, so that's one aspect of this. Um, and uh, the other thing that's interesting about it is, is coming out of this book is uh, the political life in 1824. And um, so I'm gonna read a, a few paragraphs from that. Uh, and uh, of course he was elected to the parliament in 1824. He got elected uh, for a three year term and he never got reelected and, and so forth. Uh, but this was ten years after the uh, uh, ten years after the uh, constitution had been approved, and of course at this point uh, the the king was uh, Karl Johann, you know Karl Johann. So it says here after the opening ceremony, the cabinet member Johannes uh, Kollet read this speech from the throne. Mainly, it contains this message from Karl Johann: In the Norwegian state, there ought to prevail a perfect balance between king and legislative assembly. If this should succeed. The king had to have absolute veto. The king himself complained. Complained. The words from the king were mild in form, but everybody understood what was to be the most difficult task within the months to come to consider the long list of proposed changes to the constitution that the king had presented for the previous parliament. Um, so, going on, it said the most important task for the parliament in 1824 was the tug of war between royal power and parliament. Carl Johan had presented a lot of proposed change to the constitution um, and that would weaken parliament and strengthen, strengthen royal power. power. Um, the most important proposal change was to give the king right to absolute veto. In that case, the king would be able to refuse parliamentary decisions instead of um, just by posting it, postponing it by sending it back to new discussion as president constitution allowed him to do. Carl Johan put all this prestige in the proposal and he used his brain power to prove. Um, now, another thing that happened here is that uh, there was a crown prince and his name was Crown Prince Oscar. And Carl Johan appointed him indefinitely as vice king of Norway on February 24th. 
And late at night on April 11th, Henrik and the other parliament members witnessed the jubilation with which the population met the vice king and his wife when they arrived in the illuminated streets of Christiana. This was indeed a fulfillment of a Norwegian request. A common opinion among the Norwegians was that the Norwegian speaking Oscar would be able to understand Norway and the Norwegians better than his father did, who had learned to speak neither Swedish or Norwegian. Now there's the king of Sweden and the king of Norway, Carl Johan, there's the, you know, Carl Johan Gata in, in Oslo. He couldn't speak it Swedish or Norwegian. This would be, benefit uh, Norwegian independence and besides put a king in Norway, not a king in, of Norway in Sweden. Carl Johan is probably happy to agree to the Norwegian request, not at least because he meant he would serve his own name. The crown prince would probably be able to work more efficiently to secure the king's proposal than a vice regent could. And um, now that the king, vice king was present, the vice regent position was suspended. Um, and the, April 12th, the parliament met the vice king in the building and later at night was honored by a student torchlight parade. Um, so uh, anyway, the uh, the vice king terminated the, the uh, fourth Norwegian parliament on August 9th and, and he basically accepted that, well, they, the parliament did not approve of the exchanges and uh, um, the king was uh, did state that he was satisfied with the good spirit that dominated. He said that his proposal for constitutional alteration had been rejected, but he saw that the explanation was connected to a fear against too early alteration of the constitution and not to a spirit of opposition. So that's all kind of uh, information uh, that came out of this particular book. Now, does anyone have any questions or comments about it? Or? I think that uh, I mean, this is actually a, a good example, I think, of uh, family stories that uh, we've, we've uh, talked a little bit about doing that. Our, our speaker at that time said uh, to all of us, and I'm, I'm trying to do take her advice, is the what, what you have to do is just start. So it's a good impetus for, for all of us to uh, start to put together our family, uh, family stories. And there's some really interesting uh, things in in the stories that uh, you were telling us, it sounds uh, it sounds to me like in the in the first part that you made a pretty good case for uh, this uh, the bailiff being the the father. There's a kind of a I think a kind of a long history in Norway of uh, uh, fathers actually acknowledging their illegitimate uh, children. Uh, I know that uh, uh, in, uh, in in our family one case was. Uh, uh, goes back to, uh, uh, I think it's my eighth great grandfather was illegitimate son. Um, his sister, his half sister uh, married Ludwig Rosencrantz and so became part of the, the Rosendahl barony. But uh, even so, uh, Anders got a farm. <laughs> the father gave him a farm anyway. He, he got the Helvig farm in, in Finherod. So, I, I, and there, I think there are a number of examples of that. So I actually uh, uh, would be interesting uh, 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 to know, I guess, w w what took this guy so long to acknowledge the kid? <laughs> well, I don't know. Uh, well, I'm not well, sure that, how you answer that question. I don't know about, yeah. But I think that it was clear that, you know, that it, 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 it was, there was a relationship there. Um, and then, you know, as it, as it said there, there was a rumor that uh, he actually told him that, uh, he was his father, or analogy at the end, but but obviously he was taking care of him um, along the way. Now the actually I didn't explain how I got involved with this book, um, but uh, it turns out uh, my brother actually got a email from uh, a, dis uh, a distant relative in, in that particular branch, and uh, and uh, wanted him to take a you know a genealogical DNA test. <laughs> Uh -huh. And uh, my, my brother wasn't interested, and so I did. And uh, so the, the idea was that uh, uh, I guess they wanted to somehow establish, you know, with, with DNA, you know, that this was actually the case. But every anyone that would have responded, you know, would have been in in the in the same boat, meaning that uh, you know we would accept it, you know, that we were uh, 
you know, from the, uh, well, everybody that have the same background and finding a, um, you know, a relative of the of his father it would have been a little bit more difficult. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I, they, they uh, can can do some analysis that I think that is pretty helpful for that kind of thing. Yeah. But uh, it takes some, some work and you got to get some people in the other branches of the family and things like yeah. that. Well, yeah. the other thing, the other thing that my, my cousin that does all the research there points out is that once you get to it's well, the poor, the poor, you know, the basic cotters and so forth like that, they, you know, it's a little kind of hard to follow them. And maybe you have to dig through, you know, records and things of who was on what farm when. But but once you get into any kind of a family that has a, you know, part of the aristocracy, shall we say, then then records kind of pop out and that kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, that's true. Oh, uh, uh, I don't. Um, I was going to suggest, and I, I, I mean, I don't know exactly the status of the books that you you've got, but uh, I was going to suggest that you might want to send copies to a place like the Norwegian American Genealogical Center in Madison, which has several thousand family stories as as part of their their library. Yeah. I think they'd be pretty interested in it, and probably a couple of the other libraries might be interested too. Yeah. Well, of course, it's not. This is about Norway as opposed to. Um... The settlement in the United States, but yeah, that's a possibility. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, the, uh, yeah. Yeah. Most Norwegian Americans have a few Norwegians in their background. Yeah. Uh, okay. oh, I, I have another. a question. Yeah. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, yes I can hear you. Can, oh, okay. I'm driving, so I wasn't sure if you could if this works, but okay. Um, I'm I have on my dad's side, his um, father's family is from that same general area uh, near Molda, kind of by Ida and um, uh, it's their last name was Orgasvik, uh, but he was born Lingstad and there's a guy over there named Yanni Lingstad I found him on Facebook. And he's kind of got a lot of the history of that area he's written I don't know how many pages of. He said over 4,000 pages of history about the area. So I'm wondering, you might be able to contact him. I found him on Facebook and he might have some more information about your family because it's the same general area. But also, did you, um, uh, there's no big, big book for that area yet? Or do you have any information on that? Um, well, I'm sure there are, but as I say, all the information I have is, is, is already researched, so, so I haven't been digging into those. And, uh, um, um, and, and I've put, um, well, I've, I've been putting things into uh, uh, Ancestry.com, and every once in a while, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll get a pop-up that says there's information already there about the particular relative and so forth. So I think that uh, a lot of that information is available. Okay, in Facebook, what was the fellow's name? It's Yanni, J-O-N-N-Y, and the last name is Lingstad, L-Y-N-G-S-T-A-D. S-J. Yeah, he's quite, he, uh, I'm sorry? Okay, Lingstad? Lingstad, um, L-Y-N-G-S-T-A-D. Okay. Yeah, and yeah. he's quite, and he he called me. I was surprised, but he called me. I just had shot him a message and said, are, you know, are are you any relation? And maybe you have some stories or whatever. And he called, and he was able to tell me, you know, a little bit more about the family and that, um, you know, how my great uh, grandfather passed and all that. And so yeah. that was kind of helpful. But well, as, as it turns out, we. Um... Um, I took my father to Norway and uh, when he was 86 years old, and this was in 1994. Um, so we, um, uh, we met all his cousins uh, and you know, my second cousins and so forth. So we, we have uh, a lot of information on the family itself. Um, and uh, so, uh, uh, but also uh, interesting with Vestness, now as I said, it's kind of a fair, fairy uh, tale setting. Um, on Facebook, uh, there is a um, group called uh, Builder y Vestness, or Vestness y Builder, you know, Vestness and Pictures. And uh, so it turns out that uh, there is quite a number of people that like to hike around in the area. And uh, so they take pictures and then they put it on uh, Vestness y Builder. So like every 
every day, you know, almost it's, uh, you know, you have six or seven different sets of pictures of what the, you know, scenery in, in the area of Vestness is. And, um, and then, uh, surprisingly enough, all of a sudden, uh, you know, my uh, uh, the farmhouse, you know, Cirrus, Cirrus farmhouse where my grandfather was born shows up <laughs> on Facebook, you know, um, by somebody who was hiking by, not necessarily the relative, you know, so, so uh, we, we do have a lot of connections there. Yeah, it's, it's, that's really interesting. It's uh, sort of a segue here. Maybe we can go to uh, Carolyn and talk a little bit about uh, bigger books. Okay. Okay. Um, Joel and I have been talking about trying to figure out a way to uh, find out how what members have what books and um, a good way to perhaps share them. I have a preliminary list that was developed quite a few years ago, I think, Joel, right? And yeah, at least 10. Yeah, at least 10 years old. And, um, I, you know, that'd be a good launching spot. Um, but basically, we want to try to make a list of our members that have the book, the farm books. And then from there, we're going to have to figure out a way that perhaps we can share the information. Um, I personally have never used one. I believe that uh, one of my farm family's farms is probably listed in one someplace, but um, I've never used it. So I'm not really familiar with them and I don't know how long the information would be if a person asked, like for example, my maiden name is Grand Guard. Um, my, the Grand Guard farm was in Goal and um, I'm sure it's in a farm book, um, but I don't know if it would be one page or six pages or 20 pages of information. So um, I would really like a lot of information and help from you know, people in gig to help us figure out a way that we can share that information. Um, what members would be willing to do the research? If you found something, would you scan it? Would you copy it? Would we meet perhaps at the lodge on a certain day to bring the books in and exchange some information? Um, we're just in the preliminary starting of this. My first step will be to try to make a list and then maybe get into um, how we can share the information. So I am wide open, trust me, for um, suggestions on how to do this. My, uh, because there are so many of these books out there, my, my guess is, I mean, they cover uh, relatively smaller areas. You know, so my, my guess is that the likelihood that two of our members will be from the same uh, small community uh, uh, is, is probably kind of remote. So I, I don't know how involved this, this would be, but I think, it, it, I think uh, Carolyn is right. What we need to do is start make the list and put it where people can see it, get it, spread it around. Uh, and, uh, you know, if, uh, if, if it turns out that uh, you have a relative uh, that you're looking for who's uh, from Olin, uh, you know, th th I think that book is, is, was available on the list that, that we had. So, so uh, we, uh, maybe brokering through uh, Carolyn, we could make the contact and, and kind of mm -hmm. figure out how much information needs to needs to be uh, transferred uh, and she uh, you know Carolyn is right that uh, uh, well <clears throat> just using me as an example uh, uh, in Finn Herod uh, which is in Hordaland County there there are actually two Michael bus farms uh, and I have family connections to both of them and if you look in the bigger book that it, it could be 20 or 30 pages uh, and, and so it would be kind of unreasonable to ask somebody to scan 20 pages and send it to me. Uh, but if, you know, if I have a more specific question, you know, that uh, I'm looking for my uh, great grandfather, Samson, uh, could you check, look in, in the farm and see if you can find when he was, was on the farm and uh, you know, maybe a copy of the page or just the, uh, the information about the dates might be, might be helpful. So it, it's something for all of us to think about, but I think it, it, I'll, if we start out and maybe Carolyn, you can help me prepare a little email where we just ask people for the input. I have a couple of 
of uh, people have sent me some, which I'll send to you, but we can send it broadly to the group and just ask what, what references you have uh, access to. Yep, yep, I can do that. I'll, I'll do an email and then I'll send it to you because you have the distribution list. Yep. And um, then, you know, people can either ask, answer me back directly or I'm the librarian for the lodge. So you can always send the answer to the libra librarian at norwaydc.org, either one will be fine. But yeah, let's see if we can get, update the 10 year old list and uh, take it from there. Do you know I, if any of these books have been scanned already anywhere, that there's a database maybe somewhere of scanned books already? I know that there is, I was doing a little preliminary research and I know that there are some books that are online, but they're very limited and I can't remember what the website is. I'll, I can, you know, pull that together too, but I, I do know that a few of them have been online, but you've got to be really cautious because they also still might be under copyright. And, um, you know, so we couldn't like print off a whole copy of it or something like that. But I know, I do know that some, a few of them are online. Joel, you probably know better than me. Well, I, I know that uh, none of the ones that I've looked for are online, but I'm sure that there are some. And it, it's probably, it may be worth it for us to see if we could get a list of what is available. I'm not quite sure there's a central place where that would be uh, listed. Uh, I, um, you know, there's the uh, 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 Norwegian State Library, the National uh, Bibliotheque that uh, might have, have some kind of a listing that we could, we could see. I know that uh, I've tried to go on to their sites a number of times and I, I can find some things and other things that says, oh, you're not in Norway, you can't look at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, but anyway, we can, yeah, we can look around for, for what other resources there might be. And I'll, I'll see if I can find some of that. Okay, and, and I'll and be also, looking. Sorry? Also, if you could find, could we find out what the copyright issues would be? Because um, I'd be willing to scan some for people if that, I mean, you know, if, if, uh, if there's no copyright issues, maybe we could even start scanning them ourselves. And, make one. I know it's an ambitious thing, but uh, I'm retired, so. Uh, I'll, I'll send you the, the, the two volumes of Ken Herod that I have out of five, which together oh. are a thousand pages or something like that. Oh, Lord. Okay. <laughs> but I mean, it, it's possible. I mean, I there's so many easy scanning things available now too that make it a lot easier but yeah that's true anyway it is a huge it would be a huge task but typically uh, my experience with these books is that they usually have two parts one is uh, sort of the history of the area and you know it'll go back to the viking times and they'll show some artifacts that have been found on the farms and, and, and various things like that and then there's a section where they talk about the farms themselves. And, uh, you know, when, when somebody first uh, got the farm and then the progression after that, and it, it's generally the farm owners. They, uh, so you have the owner and then their children, but, uh, you know, there's usually a section for what they call husmen, which are people who don't own the farm, but, but live there. But uh, people will slip through the cracks in these books. You won't necessarily find everybody you're looking for. They also include photographs. And um, I, I sort of by accident came across a genealogist in uh, Norway in the town where my mother's uh, father came from. And um, I wrote to her and told her who my grandmother was. And she said, oh, yes, I know who she was. She was married to... Uh, uh, well, I forget what my great grandfather's name was now, but um, anyway, she she said she would be willing to do research for me. Now I don't know, I don't read Norwegian, so it was much uh, easier to pay her a hundred dollars, and she could uh, trace the family back seven more generations. But she also, um, you know, sent me additional information that she'd gotten from the books. There were some pictures of uh, great grandmother, great great grandmother, and husband, and. Um, there was uh, information when you mentioned the poor relief fund that kind of rang a bell because my great great grandfather was 
in charge of the poor relief fund in his community, according to this woman. So uh, I took a shortcut and uh, you know I got the information I wanted that way. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. I, uh, uh, one of the books that I have, uh, you know, there's a picture. I mean, I knew it was a place where uh, my uh, uh, great grandmother had lived but there's a picture of the house and there's an older woman sitting in a chair in the distance and somebody else. And so I asked them, I said, who is that? And they said, oh, that's your great grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> sort of one of, those, uh, one of those ancestry moments, you know, where you-, where you <laughs> Right, that's neat. Well, Howard, I just wanted to thank you so much. That was such an interesting talk and I couldn't help but relate it to, you know, some questions that I've had about my own family history. Uh, my father told me that there was a rumor that we are descended from royalty. And from the information I collected, I couldn't see how this could possibly be true. But there was a mystery in my father's, I think, great-grandmother or great-great-grandmother, who, uh, whose father was a merchant in Bergen. And according to the family story, the father sent his daughter to this farm during the Napoleonic Wars. And I wondered why would they do that? They, he said it was for safety. Well, you know, I, I have so many unanswered questions, but now I'm wondering, this woman was a notable woman. She was a poet. She had seven silk dresses uh, because her, her husband, one of the farmer's sons she married uh, became a sailor. But she seemed like a more educated woman than, than the rest of the family. And uh, in, in uh, having my DNA uh, analyzed, I chose ancestry from Sweden. And I don't have any stories about ancestry from Sweden. I'm wondering now if it might be through this Bertha Elizabeth that uh, Right. We, we couldn't find out anything about her, but now, now I'm wondering, <laughs> maybe yeah. she was an illegitimate daughter because in looking up the name of her father, Henrik Meyer, there were several men with very similar names, but one was listed in the census as a merchant in Bergen. And uh, he had a family with several children who were all younger than the birth of Elizabeth. So it makes me wonder whether she was you know, a daughter that he uh, he couldn't keep when he married his present wife. Yeah. For me, what would be so helpful is, well, when I started the uh, Norwegian genealogy, when my husband and I joined the Sons of Norway. Now I'm all German, so I know nothing about Norway. I can't read a word. And, you know, to, I have the uh, farm book, but I can't read anything. If there's anybody who can, you know, help read the page and tells what it, what the country was like and what the farm was, that would be the most helpful and how to get going on this Norwegian genealogy. The uh, my, my experience is that the, the actual uh, listing of the farm owners, you, you only need a few words to be uh, to be able to decipher what what it's talking about. But you're right. There's usually a big section where it it talks about sort of the bigger history of the farm, and you know uh, you, you can make out a few words like you know the Vikings were here or something like that. But well, you, otherwise, I'm lost. <laughs> you can also find out about the farms from the census. When I first discovered the Norwegian census, I didn't notice it could be translated into English and I had no idea other than the names. I was interested in the names and the ages, the birth dates. But then I discovered, uh, you know, you can translate and it told um, what crops were grown on the farm, how many horses, how many pigs and all of those things. And of course, then the different um, categories of farmers, like you say, you know, the cotters and the others, uh, whether the man was the owner or not of the farm. So there was a lot of information just in the census. Yep, that's in, right. the, in the census, I think if you just right click, you'll get a menu and I think you can you can just select uh, translate. Yeah, and I did. I, I finally discovered that, but I, I didn't notice it when I was first doing my research. And after I found it, I thought, oh, if only I'd known. But I did find it in time to write my books. And, and I wondered, um, Joel, if you could tell me again the name of the place in Madison, because one of the things I'm looking for is what should I do with my family history? Because I, I had it put into book form, you know, um, more than 15 years ago. 
And um, I, I had um, done research in different places and uh, one person gave me a list of about nine family history museums that might be interested, but I've okay. never followed up on it. And now I'm, I realize there are a lot of questions because when I did my family histories, it was for my children. So I included myself and my brothers and sisters and cousins, and these are living people. And now um, I, looking at the Library of Congress, they do not want family histories that include people who are still living. So mm -hmm. I wondered if these other uh, family history libraries would accept um, my books. And if not, some of them are accepting books in digital form now. And if I can figure out how to do that, um, because I did them all in the old um, word perfect and it doesn't seem to translate when I try to copy it in the other format. So it would take a lot of work, but um, I, I, if I redid it, I could eliminate the chapters on the, on the living persons. I, I think that would be up to you, uh, dep you know, depending upon how uh, your relatives feel about their, their names being out there. But I can, well, uh, I don't think the relatives would object because these libraries, they're not, you know, for the general public. Usually you can't borrow them. You can go there and do research. So I think it would be useful for research because my generation, now there were six uh, children in my family, four of them have already passed away. So it won't be long. But of course, the, the chapters on our lives include the names of our children. So yeah, it's so, uh, yeah, the, 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 Madison, the Madison Library is it's uh, the full name is uh, the Norwegian American Genealogical Center and NASETH N A E S E T H Library. Okay. NASETH was the guy who sort of built the library. Oh, oh, okay. I I think that was the one that I thought was associated with the Vesterheim now. Oh, you know, uh, they might have a connection. I don't. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but and I can tell you my story. I mean, I, I've I've been going to that library for a while now. I'm kind of familiar with it. But one of the first times, uh, I, I uh, got a hold of somebody in my mother's side of the family, the Holberstein family, and uh, they, they responded to me and said, "Oh, I know you. You're in the blue book." And I said, <laughs> "What blue book are you talking about?" Uh, and it turns out that Blue Book is in the in the library in Madison. So I went to Madison and got the book, <laughs> <laughs> copies of the pages that I wanted. So so obviously uh, they'll accept books that have living people in it because I'm in the. <laughs> okay, that's that's good to know. And I I know that the book I wrote on my father's family I have a copy right here. Uh, I had it put into paperback form oh. so it would look like a book. But, um, you know, I did it all on my computer and then just had it photocopied and bound and sent to relatives. But um, when my older sister passed away this summer, her <laughs> friends found the book that I had sent her and she had contributed a lot to it. And they donated it to the University of Arizona Library because she had been a librarian there for 30 years and they have a special collection. And they didn't even consult me. They told me after the fact. So I know my book is there and I, I don't know whether they have any policy about living persons, but I'm not gonna find out. I, you know, it was because there are people who would be interested in my sister's story because when she retired, they established an endowment in her name and they give a, 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 a contribution or recognition to um, an outstanding librarian every year in her mm -hmm. name and they thought that those people would be interested in her story and her family. So um, also because of uh, letters I've gotten from relatives that I sent this book to, they have encouraged me to you know, put it someplace where future generations would have access because I did do a lot of research. The I, LDS library accepts with living people in it. Oh, okay, yeah, that's an idea. I didn't have that on my list either. I should check into that. Because my daughter-in-law did that, and she was her mother was in the book, and her mother's still alive. Oh, okay, that's useful to know. Because I I did a lot of research using their information. I found out that the at least um, the records that I could get online um, did have errors. Oh, yeah. Some some names were misspelled. 
and uh, I forget what else, but anyway, that's one of the things I found even in ship records, there were errors in the spellings of names and it got very hard to find the information I wanted. When I did, I found you know, they had listed my grandfather as Lars instead of Hans. And, <laughs> <laughs> but I could tell because his family's brother and sisters and father were all listed. So, you know, um, you, you can't always go by by the uh, information you find from LDS and other resources, but it's it's just one source of many. When when I was looking on uh, on, on family search, I stumbled on this little paragraph uh, uh, that talked about a book called the Ustergard and Stuhl and Families in America. So I I did tried everything I could do to figure figure out how to get it from uh, the the library there. Uh, and I, I couldn't find a way to, to it, it basically just said, no, you can't have access to it. So uh, I uh, uh, started Googling around and I found the book at the Nebraska State Genealogical Society. Huh. So I immediately joined <laughs> the Nebraska State Genealogical Society and they <laughs> sent it, they wanted it to me for, for like two weeks or something like that. Oh, I, I had to pay, you know, transfer, you know, shipping and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So then I immediately got it and scanned it and then sent it back. It, but in in there, uh, uh, he the, the author of it listed twenty five places where he sent it. He made like I think he made twenty five or twenty six copies. Yeah. Sent it to several genealogical societies and things like that, and that was it. <laughs> well, um, yeah, that's. Uh... You know, one reason that I'm, I'm looking into libraries where I can donate this now, I don't have enough copies, so that's why I need, I have a few copies, but um, if I want to donate to some of the others, I have to make digital copies. But if you want to, to read a book that isn't available for loan, the Library of Congress does have a lot of them. But my, my great-grandfather, who was Scottish, but he married a Norwegian great-grandmother, um, <clears throat> Uh, he did write a book of family history that is, uh, it's even listed on Amazon, although it's not available. But I found a site that listed 20 libraries that have that book, but the Library of Congress does not. So I asked them if they were interested. And I said, I was doing an updated version because I have one book, but I have two kids. And I decided if I make a, a copy, I'll add, um, you know, end notes that explain many of the things that he referred to. So I have my updated version, and uh, they said they would be interested in that because the older books are falling apart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, that's very true because in doing my research, and that you know, if you're not if you're not all in, um, aware that the Library of Congress has a family history room where you can do research and where you can borrow books and read them right there and make photocopies of certain things. Um, but uh, one of the books that I borrowed uh, was put in a box, but even so the pages were so crumbling that if I even touched it, more bits would fall off the pages. So it's a shame that these old old books are, you know, some, the, some of the paper holds up well and some doesn't. Yeah. Um, I wonder, and, uh, uh, I'd like to move on to a short discussion of some of our potential programs coming up and get get your feedback about uh, what you think. And actually talking about the Nebraska State Genealogical Society is a good starting point because uh, after I joined, I started getting information. They have a, a, a great annual meeting where they talk about uh, different methodologies that you know for, for doing genealogy and, and so forth. Uh, so I contacted the president and asked her if she would speak to our group. And she had a list of topics that she'd talk about. And one of them was introduction to DNA which I thought uh, might be kind of interesting. We we haven't gone back to DNA now for some time. We did have a speaker uh, a number of months back. So uh, I contacted her and she said, well, sure, I'll be happy to talk to you if you don't mind having a Dane come in. <laughs> and I said, I thought we could tolerate a Danish uh, speaker. <laughs> uh, well, I, I think a lot of Norwegians have a Danish connection too, because in looking up my mother's uh, father's family, uh, she, he had a, uh, his father had a middle name that did not sound Norwegian to me. So when I contacted this genealogist, I, I said, this name doesn't sound Norwegian. Do you, do you know what it is? And she said, well, your mother didn't spell it quite right. 
but it comes from Denmark. It means the family originally came from Denmark and then went up the coast of Norway and settled north of the Arctic Circle in Norway around 1700, because that's when the name first appeared in, in the, um, the uh, uh, maybe it was the Big Da Book or you know, whatever source right. she had on the families of that area. So, you know, if you go back far enough, I bet a, a lot of other people are, uh, can trace back to Denmark too. I think that's probably right. Uh, the, uh, I, I, I have a commitment from, uh, he's the archivist at the University of North Dakota Library, Michael Swanson. Uh, he's the one who, who pointed out to me that uh, the date I gave him in November is actually uh, Thanksgiving. Uh, but the University of North Dakota has one of the largest collections of bigger books that I, I have uh, heard of, uh, at least in this country. I know every time I Google to try to find a bigger book, it's there. It's at the University of North Dakota. So he, uh, he'll, he'll speak to us probably in a, in a couple of months about bigger books and give us some more information about that. Uh, that contact came through Alan. Uh, 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 grateful to Alan for making that connection, and uh, I think it'll be a good one. Um, I also have a commitment from a guy named Whit Athey, uh, who uh, the, the reason that I have I got the contact uh, was because he had previously worked at the FDA where I worked and retired, uh, but he was there before I was uh, and left before I got there. Uh, but he went on to do some work on uh, genetic genealogy and uh, uh, wrote a, a program for predicting haplogroups from Y uh, chromosome data, y, uh, from, from uh, uh, SNPs on the Y chromosome. So I have a commitment from him to speak to us in the next couple of months. Um, I have a contact, uh, I've, I've, I've sent an invitation, but I haven't gotten a response from a guy who's uh, connected with the uh, Rosendahl Barony in, uh, in Norway. Uh, which uh, uh, is one of the connections to royalty uh, from the uh, 1500s and 1600s, uh, uh, which I think would be pretty interesting. We'll see if I can uh, convince him to speak to us. And then uh, the, the other contact uh, is the one that Alan was talking about earlier with Vesterheim. And uh, uh, I think getting a speaker from Vesterheim would be, would be pretty interesting too question is, I mean, they have such a vast amount of uh, material and information. Uh, I'd be interested in hearing what people would be most interested in, in having them talk to us about. I, I'd be kind of interested in, in why so many Norwegians came to America, what life was like in Norway, why they were looking for, uh, you know, a better life, mm -hmm. and what they were hoping for. And I know Vesterheim has, uh, you know, I've been there and, uh, you know, they have, um, they, they have an outdoor uh, museum with uh, buildings and a, a house actually from Norway. The longhouse. Yeah. I'd like to piggyback on what she says. I would like to know the nitty gritty of daily life on a Norwegian farm. You know, what, what did the boys have to do? Um, how did they stay alive? How many days did they go to school? Uh, they didn't have roads to walk on. Uh, and who sold their clothes or how'd they get their clothes? And what did their foods consist of? Mm -hmm. I'd like to know how they survived before they sent one person off to America and how did they get enough money to send them? I guess most of them came as indentured. One of the speakers <laughs> That we did have, I think, from Vesterheim uh, was on the restoration. You know, the uh, ship that came over in 1825 uh, supposed to be the uh, Norwegian Mayflower. Um, it, it was it was pretty interesting. I, but one of the things I was hoping for from from that was more information about uh, how how people lived. Uh, it was pretty much a chronology of how they got here. Half of them were Quakers. I think there were 60 some people on the boat, half of them were Quakers. And it turns out the other half were uh, from a kind of a sect, influential sect in, in Norway, the, the Haugians, uh, which I was pretty interested in because a couple of my great grandfathers were supposed to be Haugians. I'm kind of looking into that, but uh, 
but yeah, I think that would it, that would uh, be interesting, both from the standpoint of uh, what was life like in Norway, but also what was life like uh, here uh, in you know 1830, 1840, 1850 uh, for these people. Uh, so I'll follow up on the contact that Alan made and try to uh, negotiate with them for what what they would be willing to talk to us about. Um, but the, you know the, the rest of what I wanted to talk about was um, I mean I, I enjoyed the, uh, the the story from from Howard uh, this afternoon. Uh, and I'm just wondering um, uh, how much interest there is in uh, exploring some of these individual family stories and uh, 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 having our members come in and talk about uh, some of the interesting things in the in their families. I liked one of the things I liked about it, and one of the things I'm trying to, I'm trying to uh, I've got an outline. I'm trying to get pen to paper and start to write a story. Uh, one of the things I liked about what Howard did was uh, the connection between the family members and what was going on at the time. You know what was going on uh, in Norway. The the uh, the, the stuff about uh, the storting um, really intrigued me because I also have a great grandfather who served in the storting, and uh, uh, I'd like to kind of understand better some of those dynamics and how that worked. He, he was. Um, I, ha I have two or three people in in my tree that I that I'm just absolutely fascinated with, and this is one of them. Uh, he, he also only served for a couple of years. Um, apparently, the, the reason that was given for him not getting reelected was that he was trying to stop the churches from selling alcohol. <laughs> um, but the other thing he did was to argue against what's called the Conventicle Act, which was what uh, made, made it illegal for uh, lay people to preach. And he got up in the starting and said something like, here we are in this free country. We can all get together and talk about anything we want except the word of God. <laughs> we can't talk about that. <laughs> and they finally did, uh, a couple years after he uh, went out, they finally did uh, repeal that. Uh, but uh, it was a time of a lot of uh, change in, you know, in, the, in the first half of the 19th century in Norway. Sorry, I'm diverging into my family story. <laughs> A couple of things came, <clears throat> excuse me. A couple of things came to mind uh, when Howard was um, talking earlier. One was the uh, getting married at three months. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I ran, I've run into that situation many times. I don't even look. I don't even. I don't, I don't even look twice about that anymore. It's pretty common. Yep. And, the other thing was um, the connections to Denmark has been mentioned a couple different uh, times. I'd be interested because I know I have one, but I don't know if there are typical reasons for Danes to end up in Norway or Norwegians to end up in Denmark, or if they're just, you know, I don't know how that, how that happens. I mean, clearly it's not trivial to you know, get on a boat and go from one place to the other. There's got there's got to be some impetus for for that to happen. And I I'm just looking for clues. You know, I, I don't have any. I'm just you know shooting in the dark in my situation. So I, it'd be interesting if other people have connections or know if there are typical ones or that kind of thing. Yeah, I then, wondered that too because you know with my family leaving Denmark. Uh, from the town of Rinkeping, which is on the, um, the west coast of Denmark, going up the coast of Norway, up uh, to the um, uh, Vesterålen Islands, north of the Lofoten Islands, um, it's sort of a really harsh environment so far north. And you wonder, why would they do that to come from Europe, which is, you know, fairly uh, civilized, and up to a place where life must have been very hard where all the men made their living by fishing and many of them died at sea because they fished in these little open boats, little more than a rowboat. And, uh, and, and they were able to raise a few crops in the maybe three months that they had where these things would grow. But why would they do that? It's just very puzzling to me. On, yeah. on purpose. I used to say they lost a bet or something. <laughs> <laughs> 
Why would somebody go to the Arctic Circle on purpose? And what woman, what woman would join them? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they were way north of the Arctic Circle. I, I took a cruise up the coast there. I was amazed. It took about four hours to pass the Arctic Circle and then to see in the distance the, the mountains where I knew my, my grandfather had come from, though I, we didn't land there. Uh, do, do you know the book, The Mercies? No. Uh, it was uh, our reading group just uh, read it, and uh, there's a joint meeting with the Norwegian History uh, Roundtable uh, talking about uh, somebody translated. It's about witch trials in 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 Norway. Oh and, yes, I re I heard about it. I didn't read it. And um, uh, so somebody has translated the uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, the transcripts of the trials, and so there's a meeting coming. Oh. Where that person will talk to the reading group and to the history group, um, I'm, I'll, I'll make sure that information gets out there for people. Okay. Um, it, it, it's that same area that you're talking about, I think, up in that neck of the woods. Uh, yeah. Um, do you know about Oli Rolvag, Saint Olaf? Oh yeah. Yeah, he was a professor there, and actually, my father went to Saint Olaf. Uh, my father was born in 1890. And uh, he went to St. Olaf for two years, had Rolvog for a professor. But in reading about his life, kind of kind of parallels my uh, my mother's father's life, and you know, living as a fisherman and then coming to America around age twenty. Interesting, yeah. Uh, uh, we just had, uh, I, th I think, the last month our speaker was from St. Olaf, uh, and talking about how they're getting the Rolvog collection digitized and a bunch of things like that. So. They're really trying to uh, make progress in, in getting their different collections online. I, I'm sorry, I, I didn't catch that, Joel. They're, they're getting information on what? Oh, uh, they, well, you know, they have the, the whole Rolvog uh, collection. Oh, oh, the Rolvog. And he wrote, he wrote a, a book a lot of people have read, The Giants in the Earth. Right. Uh, and so they're, but they're, they're digitizing a lot of his papers and things uh, to make them available. Yeah. Well, I, I actually used a quote from him in, in the um, beginning of my book here. Uh, let me show you, you know, before I start, there's this little quote from him. I'll tell you what he said. It is vital in all cultural life to maintain a link between the present and the past. If there is anything that history makes clear, it is this, that when a people becomes interested in its past life and seeks to acquire knowledge in order to better to understand itself, it always experiences an awakening of new life. Huh. I like that. I see. Yeah, yeah, that's really good. Uh, I, um, you sent me the uh, sent me your email earlier, so I sent you this link. I took the liberty of adding you to our mailing list, if you don't mind. That's fine. Thank you. I I don't like to put people on there if they're if if they don't want their inbox filled up with. <laughs> trivia from me you know but well I, I wasn't sure that that it would be useful for me to join because I've done my books you know and I've, I've done other things in the meantime and I'm just now getting back I guess because of the pandemic spending more time alone and then getting an email from a man who uh, I haven't even met but he's a, a relative of one of my mother's cousins a descendant and you know I forget which generation and he, he said he had recently come across this book and uh, just wanted to tell me again how, how much he enjoyed it and how useful he thought it was. And it made me think that, well, if people really, you know, appreciate these books, I really ought to make sure that they get um, continued and available to, to, you know, the, those who, like my sons who are now in their 50s, I, I find a lot of people start getting really interested in family history when they're in their 60s. Yes. So, <laughs> so I'm thinking of, of my, my kids and their cousins that are probably going to want to, you know, pick up these books and then go from there. And as, as I said in my books, you know, I've, I've put in, in these books everything that I could find out, but I'm sure there's much more to learn and, you know, future generations can continue the research. Yeah, we all, all become interested when it's too late to ask our grandparents all those important questions. We have. Well, I was fortunate that my parents were still living. And because I lived in the East, in the Washington area, my parents were in North Dakota. 
I only spent maybe a few days with them during the summer and my kids barely knew their grandparents. And I'd forgotten so many of the things that they had told me. So I, in one of my visits, I said, um, especially my father who was so old, he was 50 when I was born, but he lived to be 96. And I said, uh, you know, if you could just write down the, the stories that you remember from your childhood and especially your ancestry from Norway, because the things I've heard, I just can't remember and I want my kids to learn. And he made a tape recording and sent it to me so I still, I even have his voice, you know, and then I transcribed that. So the next year I asked my mother, if she would do the same thing. And each of them consulted relatives. And then I, you know, I found out other cousins of mine had started writing bits of family history. And there were little stories that had been published. And, uh, you know, there were just, and then I found out about the internet and how you could do research on uh, on uh, the census and uh, you know it, there's just so much rich material available now that so, uh, it, it really absorbed me for about four years I think. So so I guess we're going to have to invite you to make a presentation to this group. I could read a story or two from my books you know because a lot of what I included in them rather than writing stories myself I, I compiled and mm -hmm. then you know wrote enough connecting material so that it was a continuing story. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been uh, uh, very interesting. Thank you for uh, uh, for coming on. Uh, I, I have one more question. Um, sure. I, I have not uh, talked to Bert Kosky for years, but I live at uh, Asbury Methodist Village. I had gone to a few Sons of Norway meetings, but then when I moved up to Gaithersburg and my husband's health was poor, I couldn't really leave him to go down to Virginia. So I haven't been very active, but um, Bert contacted me and well, maybe I'd re read something that he wrote about um, different members contributing their own family histories to a book. And so he gave me a, a copy of what he had written about his family. And so I did that with each of my grandparents and included pictures and wondered if anything had been done with that project or if anyone else, or, you know, I don't know anything about Bert, if he's still active. The, uh, what you're talking about is what's called the Roots Project, which was done a number of years ago and was primarily on paper. Uh, it's not clear now where all of those uh, stories are. There's a notebook somewhere that has them. They were never uh, scanned or put online or anything like that. So it's uh, one of our members, Christine Maloney, is really interested in it and would, would like to revive it. So that's okay. something to think about. Um, Bert, uh, uh, Bert is in some uh, decline. He's in a, uh, what, what do they, what do they call that place, uh, Carolyn? A memory, uh, uh, um, he's in memory care. He's memory care, right. unfortunately, de you know, suffering from dementia or Alzheimer's uh, an onset. Yeah, of I, I thought I had heard that, but I couldn't remember yeah. who had told me. And, uh, you know, I, I was a little unsure whether I should ask about him. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, yeah, he's one of the stalwart figures in the history of, of this lodge. Well, he, definitely. He actually came here to Asbury Methodist Village once. I, I have a little group here that I started of people with the Scandinavian ancestry. Started okay. out with a man I met who, whose wife found that he was uh, descended from the Vikings and she had done his, uh, his uh, genealogy going way back. And when I said, well, I've been doing research and my ancestors were also Norwegian. He said, well, we have to get all these Norwegians together. And uh, <laughs> eventually I, I discovered there were a few other people and many of them had uh, Swedish or other connections. So now we just call ourselves Nordic friends. Mm -hmm. But we, if any of you are interested in visiting, we do like to have visitors come talk to us and share whatever you have to share. Uh, I, I'm, I'm in uh, basically Darnstown. Uh, well, if you'd like to visit Asbury sometime, uh, let me know and let me know what you'd like to do. I don't know if you know Christy Johnson. Her husband was a member and she had Swedish ancestry, um, but she played the, the Swedish fickle, fiddle, the Nick, nickel harp. Yeah. 
she came and demonstrated that for us once. Oh, she yeah. also um, had uh, done research on Hans Christian Andersen, so she did a presentation of that. Interesting, yeah. I had a couple of thoughts about the, the Big to Book uh, part of the discussion. <clears throat> I've been to UND <clears throat> to their library several times. And um, at first I kind of knew exactly which Big to Book I was after and, and um, what farm. And then it quickly cascades because it, your family isn't typically from a farm it it you know you, the next thing the next generation next thing you know you're at another farm for the grandparent and then another farm for the great grandparent and then another farm you know they they don't necessarily come from miles and miles away but but um you have to get the right pages out of the big the book or the right big the book sometimes um and so the reason why i've been there several times is because I learn a bit, not that I can speak Norwegian, you don't really need to. I, Joel kind of uh, touched on this. You can, you can find patterns of words. These aren't, these aren't uh, story paragraphs and sentences. These are more like, almost like tables. So if you just learn the vocabulary and, and Google, Google will help you with that a great deal. Just, just type in Google, Norwegian to English and you'll get a you'll get a little bubble you just type in the Norwegian and it'll spit out the English and even if it's old Norwegian sometimes it's enough to where you get the you get the gist but um yeah I mean um it's kind of uh, where am I going it it, it cascades it, it gets bigger fast so initially I would get just the farms I would scan pages out of a book and I would spend quite a few hours finding these things and then scanning them with this really nice scanner they have there. Mm -hmm. And then after a while, I would just go and scan dozens and dozens of pages. I just shotgun because when I would get home, inevitably I was missing something because it, you know, the great uncle went out, came from this farm or something like that. It's like, Oh, I didn't get that one. I never saw that coming. So it just, you could spend days and days just, you know, on a book and there are shelves and shelves and shelves of these books. So um, it might be make sense just to simply get a spreadsheet with an inventory of which books people have, maybe scan the, the cover of the book and the, and the table of contents in the book, because that shows that lists all your farms. And yeah. then yeah. people can say, okay, I, I see you have, this book and this farm's in there, you know, maybe you could scan, you know, we, we don't want to, there are copyright issues. So, um, you know, I, I have, I, I've shared plenty of pages with, with family and stuff like that, but I'm not printing it and I'm not taking those images and putting them onto ancestry, but I, I don't feel bad about sending them off to, you know, family members. This is what you want to see. I know that because they're associated with me. I know what they want to see. I just send them a bulk, you know, via Dropbox or something like that. But yeah. uh, it can get, it can get big, you know, and I, and I just scratched the surface at UND and my family, there's so much there. So you're right. As you work back, you go to grandparents and great grandparents, it doubles every generation. So you get out to about 10 yeah. generations and you've got a thousand of them you're looking for. So uh, and then, you know, the next thing you know, they, the, the grandmother comes from on the other side of the fjord, you know, well, there's another parish, there's another book. So, yeah. and then that, that cascades too. So, you know, there's a little bit of work involved, but you don't have to be a Norwegian reader, first of all, and you just have to have the, the patience to start recognizing the vocabulary and using Google Translate to, you know, get the words well, we're all going to make a list of people we're looking for. And the next time you go to North Dakota, you can, you can scan all the pages for us. <laughs> you know, you know that's, that's not a, you know, that's not a bad, uh, I, the last time I was there, I think I spent three hours just standing at the, at the scanner, scanning one page after another page, after another page. Yep.
All right, this has been uh, really interesting and, and useful, I think. So thank you all. Uh, I guess we'll reconvene in, in January. I'll send out an email uh, about, about some of our discussions and uh, see if we can get some more input on a few of these questions. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, happy holidays, I guess. <laughs> thank you very much, Joel. I've enjoyed yep. it. Thanks, Joel. Sure. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.